Um, so uh, this event uh, is part of the uh, LSE's uh, events program. As I say, it's also part of the Beverage Festival, and it's it's also um, part of a, a project called Cold War um, International Law that Matt Craven and I uh, co-direct with our colleague Sandhya Pahuja at the University uh, of Melbourne, and we'll be trying to bring some of these themes together. So I'm going to read out something about this. So where's it gone? It's disappeared already. Never mind. That's that's all right. Um, so on the 10th of June. 1941, Arthur Greenwood MP announced in the House of Commons that he had, had arranged with all the departments concerned for a comprehensive survey of existing schemes of social insurance and allied services, which would be considered in due course by the Committee on Reconstruction Problems, of which he was a chairman, and that Sir William Beveridge had accepted his invitation to become chairman of an interdepartmental committee which would conduct the survey, taking into account representations received from responsible organisations and persons concerned with the problems involved. Um, that sounds like a very technocratic description uh, of a world that we still uh, live in. But at the same time, or rather two months later, so this was in June 1941, I mean, right at the height of the Second World War. Uh, two months later, Winston Churchill uh, took a train from Houston in, in early August, um, possibly the sleeper train that still runs to the north of Scotland. And he arrived, in fact, at my hometown, um, Thurzo, and then went to the harbor there at Scrabster and took a ship to the coast of Newfoundland where he met up with uh, FDR. And they signed the Atlantic Charter. And in a way, that's if, if the beverage report is the domestic mm -hmm. part of this uh, puzzle, then mm -hmm. this was the international part. Because uh, in the Atlantic Charter, uh, what we now think of as the Anglo-American Alliance uh, was formed. Uh, and the, I think the exclusion of the Soviets from this picture mm -hmm. also fits in with a kind of origins of the Cold War moment. So we can think of the, uh, perhaps the origins of the Cold War being uh, around about the same time as the uh, origins of the um, beverage report. Um, so another way to the, this would be through, uh, so we have heard a, held a Cold War seminar in Tbilisi that the three of us were speaking at this summer. And uh, it was in a writer's retreat in the mm -hmm. center of Tbilisi, the, the old Soviet writer's house. Uh, and they had a guest writer upstairs, Svetlana uh, Alexeyevich, a very, very well-known uh, Russian writer whose book, Secondhand Times, become quite famous. So I was tempted to invite her down to give a sort of uh, impromptu keynote. Um, but in, in, in her second-hand time, she interviews Sovaks. Uh, and these Sovaks, these old Soviet citizens, were, appeared to be nostalgic for sort of three different mm -hmm. Soviet unions. So there's a Soviet Union that never existed, uh, or didn't quite exist, or maybe existed only for a tiny amount of time. And this is the originals of the Bolshevik, anarchist, perhaps even free love, libertarian mm -hmm. Soviet Union. Uh, of the early 20th century. And then there's also a nostalgia in these books for, so un slightly unlikely nostalgia, for uh, 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 the Stalinist Soviet Union that did exist, um, but turned into, a, into the, sort of the Gulag or, or, or the sort of Brezhnevian sclerotic period of the Soviet Union. Um, and of course the personality cult and then, and then a third Soviet Union these people seem to be nostalgic for was the Perestroika Glasnost Soviet Union of Gorbachev, another really short-lived uh, moment. Um, so tonight, uh, we're gonna, we're, we'll perform a kind of nostalgia and anti-nostalgia uh, for the Cold War, for the dirigee state, and for a certain kind of uh, international law that may or may not have gone missing um, after the Cold War. Um, Sheila Fitzpatrick, the great Australian historian of the Soviet Union, talked about the way in which time is out of joint then for Soviet man and woman. Um, first, there was socialism, uh, then capitalism. 
Well, that's not how Marx envisaged the arc of history. Um, so one of Alexievich's interlocutors says something like this, and I'm paraphrasing, life is better under capitalism, but I'm disgusted by it. Uh, and maybe Soviet man is not so unlike Western or Atlantic man and woman in this regard, because if we think about beverage, we might say first we had socialism, um, now we have capitalism, or then we have capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and our socialism, uh, a socialism that I think to a certain extent is still uh, around us, was partly the creation of this man uh, called William um, Beveridge, and we call his creation uh, the welfare state. So our subject tonight involves an unlikely uh, cut plane or, or trip plane of uh, beverage, and the Cold War uh, and international law. I mean, maybe it's a quadrupling. It's beverage, the Cold War, uh, international law, and the LSE, because beverage was a director uh, of the LSE during the interwar years. And he went from being a director of the, of the LSE uh, to being called into action to become what Susan Peterson and the uh, LRB said a few weeks ago, a one-man minister for post-war reconstruction and planning. And in that role, he was very instrumental in establishing or creating, amongst other institutions in the United Kingdom, the, the, the National Health Service. Um, but as I say, there are other links. Um, and I've mentioned something about the origins of the Cold War and the welfare state or the beverage moment. Um, as I say, they certainly incubate in a formal sense, at the heights of the Second World War in 1941. Um, but maybe we can trace uh, Beveridge and the Cold War back to, I don't know, maybe the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, maybe the great reform movements of the, of the late uh, 19th century. And then finally, what of international law? Uh, did international law have a beverage moment. I mean, can we look back on the Cold War, for example, and find a beverage moment in international law, a moment of, of reconstruction or redistribution or social engineering, or is that a promising uh, direction in which international law might travel? Um, so we can have a number of hypotheses about this. One would be that uh, the new international economic order, so Third World International Law represented a possible uh, halted, uh, postponed um, beverage moment, charter on the rights and duties of states. Uh, maybe decolonization was a kind of beverage moment. Maybe the creation of the non-aligned movement, which we're very nostalgic about, was a, was a beverage moment in 1955, exactly sort of 10 years after beverage himself. Or, um, maybe we should just give up on this quest to find a beverage moment in international law together. Um, this is one of these panels where you come up with the idea and then you have to fill the idea in with background detail and facts. Um, but maybe we should give up on this idea. Maybe there is just a, a disjuncture between domestic and international space. So I mean, a number of philosophers through the ages have believed that, that the local or the domestic or the state is where law and politics takes place. And in fact, you can't do law and politics at the international level. That's the level of, of, um, of anarchy and anti-politics and war and a state of nature and war of all against all. So the, 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 the sort of law and politics of beverage, especially the thick um, social welfare law and politics of beverage, just isn't a possibility in the domestic Base, unless one believes in the, in the domestic analogy. Anyway, to discuss these and other matters uh, this evening, we've got, uh, speaking second, or speaking third altogether, if you include me as the first speaker, uh, Matt Craven, who is a professor of international law at the School of Oriental and African Studies and the director of the Center for the Study of Colonialism, Empire, and International Law. Um, his books include a book on uh, economic and social rights, and a more recent book, which won the European Society of International Law Prize on the decolonization of international law. 
Um, speaking first will be Tatiana Borisova, who's just, oh, you just arrived today, haven't you, from, from yes. or yesterday from, mm -hmm. from Russia, who's an associate professor at the St. Petersburg School of Social Sciences and Humanities in the Department of History, and was a co-author of a book called The Legal Dimensions of the Cold War, uh, some notes from the field. Um, so what we'll do is we'll have a couple of presentations um, and then we, we might engage in a quasi-conversation up here, and then we'll open it up to you for, for questions. So, Tatiana, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And since, well, looking at the audience, it looks like it's the majority are not actually veterans of Cold War. <laughs> and I thought that we might have some fun in this St. Valentine's Day and have some introduction in the Cold War studies. If you watch a short clip from quite famous in history, but quite forgotten, speech of John Kennedy called actually peace speech. So it starts with a very nice complimentary words about English universities, and that's a part of my compliment of being here, being, being very proud and happy to be in London School of Economics. And then it goes in what I think are the kind of major lines of Cold War. So we would probably start watching this. Public support. There are a few earthly things more beautiful than a university wrote John Masefield in his tribute to English universities, and his words are equally true today. He did not refer to towers or to campuses. He admired the splendid beauty of a university because it was, he said, a place where those who hate ignorance may strive to know, where those who perceive truth may strive to make others see. I have therefore chosen this time and place discuss a topic on which ignorance too often abounds, of the truth too rarely perceived, and that is the most important topic on earth, peace. What kind of a peace do I mean, and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana, enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave, or the security of the slave, I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and build a better life for their children, not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women, not merely peace in our times, but peace in all time. I speak of peace because of the new face of war. Total war makes no sense in an age where great powers can maintain large and relatively invulnerable nuclear forces and refuse to surrender without resort to those forces. It makes no sense in an age where a single nuclear weapon contains almost 10 times the explosive force delivered by all the Allied air forces in the Second World War. It makes no sense in an age when the deadly poisons produced by a nuclear exchange <laughs> would be carried by wind and water and soil and sea to the far corners of the globe and a generation yet unborn. Today, the expenditure of billions of dollars every year on weapons acquired for the purpose of making sure we never need them is essential to the keeping of peace. But surely the acquisition of such idle stockpiles, which can only destroy and never create, is not the only, much less the most efficient, means of assuring peace. I speak of peace, therefore, as the necessary rational end of rational men. I realize the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war. 
and frequently the words of the pursuers fall on deaf ears, but we have no more urgent task. Some say that it is useless to speak of peace. Remarks of the press. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think that speech given in <coughs> June 1963 in the heyday of Cold War, so to say, gives you some ideas of the essential uh, of, the, of the essentialities of Cold War in terms of its modernist nature. Kennedy s speaks about peace in very universalist categories. He speaks about peace as something that can be shared by all men and women, something that sh should be obtained uh, for the unborn generations even. And that's very important part of Cold War discourse that if we think of one of the possible questions of our discuss discussion, if we live in a new way, way uh, in a new way, in, in a new stage of Cold War nowadays, I think that this modernist uh, discourse is evaded in the sense that this discourse of moral outrage, the discourse of moral su superiority of a particular superpower over another superpower, and that's the United States and the USSR. This discourse of moral superiority that actually uh, triggered the development of social, social rights all over the world, that actually uh, created the competition in terms of welfare in all over the world, it has been missing with the uh, end of the Cold War, uh, the solution of the Soviet Union in 1991. So I think this is a very important part of discussion of Cold War period that we should take into account that we, that we discuss Cold War legacies and Cold War, I would say, political, historical, cultural, and legal meaning nowadays. This is one thing that I was thinking about uh, when, when I was anticipating our discussion. I was not really thinking about presentation. I thought we would discuss more. And so I think the, the other important issue that we could also <coughs> touch upon is this Pax Americana that uh, John uh, Kennedy mentions in this particular speech, because that, I don't know what was your impression of this speech when you saw it. I think it, it sounds so different to the discourse of political leaders that we have nowadays, and this is 50 years before now, right? And this is how backward we went afterwards. But I need to provide you with further context, saying that he, uh, Kennedy provides this speech uh, June 10th, 1963, when Americans are deeply involved in Vietnamese war, right? When there are over 16,000 military personnel, American military personnel, is, is involved in uh, southern Vietnam already. So there is no peace, actually. But the propaganda of peace brings moral dividends, so to say, for the superpower. So there is this constant di dimension of moral struggle that the Kennedy is developing in this speech. And in actually, <coughs> in a couple of weeks, he gives another speech in Berlin. It's a rather famous speech as well called, I'm a Berliner. And I, I, I'm like, you've been a Berliner. That was a bit confusing speech since Berliner is a donut and he just <laughs> made it up in order to support Western Berlin. Uh, in its struggle against the war being erected by the Soviets. And that's a very aggressive speech 
against those who think that the communism is our future, those who think that uh, communism will bring us freedom. It's another dimension. And the funny thing that, unlike the first speech that has been translated immediately in, in Russian and appeared in Pravda just the very, very second day he spoke the speech, that actually proved that the Iron Curtain has never been iron, but on the other hand was transparent. And there were lots of exchanges through it. And this is something that what, what historians are working a lot these days. So the, this other speech, this I'm a Berliner speech, has been ignored as a kind of disgrace of Kennedy, who could have been a partner in peaceful coexistence. That's a very important concept of Cold War that is very timely today, I think. The, the concept that was proposed by, uh, by Khrushchev uh, as a part of more cooperation with the West, as a part of less aggressive clash between, uh, for the leadership in morals, so to say. So the peaceful coexistence is something that implied at least attempts to, to listen to the other, to understand the ends of the other, and to, and to keep the, the struggle for leadership in both inside the countries and outside the countries. So the Cold War, can, and this is something I should really stop with and pass my word to Matt, is a very important period of this rivalry for better uh, social system, for better ideology, for better benefits, working class people in the USSR, for instance, and development of social rights. And this perspective of Cold War is something that has not been really developed so far. And this is something that we should have a look at as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I've got rather a lot written here. <laughs> I'll give you my answer. How can I, can I cut through this? Um, in the spirit of trying to keep this a conversation, I will try to um, speak in some way form of that, uh, what I've written, but maybe some of it can come out in the conversation. I just could pick up a couple of things that both Gary and Tatiana um, gestured towards. Um, so Gary, you set it out, I think, indicating at the outset that you know, we've got three things in play here. Um, four, if you include the LSE, but uh, excuse me, I'll leave that off the table for the moment. We'll bring it back at the end. Um, so how does the LSE fit in? But, but clearly the three ideas, the beverage uh, report, the, the, the emergence of, of welfareism, um, secondly, the Cold War, and thirdly, international mm -hmm. war. And I suppose part of the question would be how would one think about linking those three things together? Um, uh, and, and you suggested to begin with, Gary, that maybe they can't be linked, so maybe they don't fit together. And, and, mm -hmm. and one of the ways in which I wanted to go through this was to say, well, actually, there's three possible formations or three possible relationships that, that we can see here. The, the first would be, actually, there isn't any relationship. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so one way of thinking about this would be that there's nothing to suggest that a peculiarly British governmental formation that was appearing in the aftermath of the Second World, World War had anything much to say about either the Cold War or international law. One could construe this as a local experiment configured around the contradictory social and political dynamics of a great power in decline after a sapping World War, enjoined with the task of restructuring the economy and providing social necessities for a working class returning from the battlefield. So one way of just saying this is local, this is, mm -hmm. doesn't speak to anything else. Um, and one could go on from that and say, well, actually, the beverage agenda was certainly not sanctioned by the extant terms of international law, 
uh, as it was developing the interwar years. Indeed, you could plausibly interpret the case, or make it a case for the, the argument that at least the PCIJ, the Permanent Court of International Justice, and most mainstream Western international lawyers have been waging a silent war against the projects of nationalization and social revolution um, in the interwar years. Um, first of all against Mexico and Romania, mm -hmm. later on the Soviet Union, later still through Iran and Egypt. Um, so if you, from the perspective of the terms of international law as they were received around that stage, mm -hmm. you could say this is disjunctive, this is out of place. Viewed in the same sense from the perspective of the Cold War, um, the same welfareist agenda, given that it brought in its train the nationalization of whole swathes of the British life, iron and steel, railways, canals, Soviet aviation, energy, gas, coal, etc., might pos position Britain not on the side of the West in the Cold War, mm -hmm. but actually where it sits geographically, somewhere mid between. <laughs> Washington and Moscow, mm -hmm. and possibly 2,000 miles closer to Washington, mm -hmm. Moscow than Washington. So, what, viewed both from the perspective of international law, the framework is the framework of international law, and from the perspective of how we tend mm -hmm. to think about the Cold War, then uh, beverage reform seem to be out of place. Don't speak to either agenda. Mm -hmm. So, a, net, a mm -hmm. second way of thinking about mm -hmm. that relationship would perhaps be to take the idea of welfareism or the idea of the welfare state back to some of its, it, 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 its, its uses, not etymological, but its uses in the, the interwar years. And there was a, notably a, a, an account of welfare states that was developed by Zimmer, um, who was well known for his, his, his books on the League of Nations, where he wanted to contrast welfare states with power states. Um, mm -hmm. And in Zimmern's account, um, the welfare states were contrasted with power states insofar as and to the extent that they did dedicated greater proportions of resources to social expenditure as opposed to arms. Um, mm -hmm. This was subject to a critique by E.H. Mm -hmm. e. Carr in, 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 in the the aftermath of the Second World War, where he pointed out that um, this was a, in a sense, a redundant or reductive way of thinking about it. Carr's critique was that every great power takes the view that the minimum number of guns necessary to assert the degree of power, which it considers requisite, takes precedence over butter, and so that it can only pursue welfare when this minimum has been achieved. So on Carr's view, Britain was, and could be regarded as a welfare state up to 1933, and only after 1935 did it become a power state at the, at, at the mm -hmm. point at which expenditure on arms outweighed that of social welfare. Now, I think that one of the things that to draw out of this is that in some ways the slightly reductive terms of that debate. It's, it's entirely, in a sense, a quantum analysis of what constitutes a welfare state and what doesn't constitute mm -hmm. Constitute a welfare state. It's not concerned with the form or the modalities by which social assistance uh, is, is, is produced. It's not concerned with nationalisation. It's not concerned with public ownership. But I think one of the things it does point, bring into view is the particularities of the welfare state and the beverage reforms and the way in which the delivery of social assistance mm -hmm. and national health were to be provided. <laughs> and the particularities of the welfare state as we now come to understand it in the aftermath of the Second World War. Um, and I think one of the p p central features of it is the idea, or caught up in the idea, that the welfare of the population is, comes to be articulated as a direct rather than an indirect end of governmental power, mm -hmm. in which centralised management of the economy either on one hand by nationalization and centralized planning, or on the other hand by the ordering, regularization, and defense of the market economy. Both of those are means by which the legitimate and the only end of the government can be achieved, i.e. to promote the welfare of the inhabitants. So I think there is a particular formation that comes around which since combines the possibilities of both the delivery of social welfare through the market and social welfare through the centralized state, 
but it was a different formation than that which had preceded it. And I think that formation is the formation that gets picked up by the international lawyers in the aftermath of the Second World War, where you have the likes of Wilf Wilfred Jenks, Philip Jessup, Wolfgang Friedman, to name just three, who start to articulate the ends of international law in similar terms. So to them, the ends of international law are the, in Jenks' terms, the common law of mankind, or in Friedman's terms, of a shift from a law of coexistence to a law of cooperation. So Friedman's accounts is that, that international law is developing, is evolving to, to bring into play or bring in as its ends human welfare and the conditions of labor mm -hmm. and the rules specificity are low in matters of trade, finance, transport, agriculture, health, education, um, communications and transport. Each of these fields being superintended by uh, an own, its own inter international institutional bureaucracy. So the challenge for Friedman and the likes of that were how one was to shift the terms of international law from this law of coexistence to a law of cooperation mm -hmm. through the institutional architecture of international agencies, international organizations. This, on the face of it, was not a Cold War rhetoric. In fact, it, one could think about it as being deliberately opposed to the parameters of Cold War thought. Mm -hmm. Indeed, if you look at Friedman's book, through all 396 pages of it, there are only three references to the Cold War, all of which are mm -hmm. almost entirely incidental. Um, so, for, for viewed perhaps from the perspective of these new international legal welfareists, if you want to call them, um, the Cold War represented all that they were against. This was mm -hmm. an old form of primitive com conflict fought out in the, the, the language of power politics uh, through the medium um, of, of ideas of nation and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And the law that governed the Cold War was mm -hmm. the old law of coexistence and the, the new law, the law that had to be pushed, that was emerging on the horizon was the law of cooperation. There is, however, a third account uh, of the relationship, the triptych. And the first account, as I said, is where there isn't really a relationship between them at all. The second suggests that there's a relationship there between beverage and international law, but the Cold War is out on a limb as something else. Uh, the third account perhaps brings all three things into play more directly. Uh, and I wanted to start in a slightly odd place with this, with an article that was written by Joseph Kuntz in 1951, <coughs> entitled, uh, in brief terms, The Chaotic State of the Laws of War. And he was making a case for the, the revitalization of the laws of war. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, it came out in 1951 after the conclusion of the Geneva Convention, so I can only assume that it was written in advance of the... the, the, the Geneva conferences. Um, but what it does is to describe in the outset the, the, the emergent laws of war from the early 20th century. Um, and he suggests that in the, the Hague Conventions of 1907 were premised upon doctrines of democracy, capitalism, and economic liberalism. And the Rousseau Portale doctrine and the stick, strict stick distinction between the armed forces and the civilian population. However, in the course of the ensuing half century, war had been progressively more and more total. Um, and that was a consequence not only, uh, or not, of the, the, the dominance of totalitarian thought, contrary to the terms of the Nuremberg Tribunal, but the combination of two things. One was a technological progress of arms, submarine warfare, aerial warfare, long range artillery. And secondly, uh, unlimited war ends. The mm. idea that the economy could be brought into the field of conflict, that the citizenry should be, could be directed to uh, and also uh, it be encompassed within the battlefield. Um, so the idea that warfare had become un more unlimited both in terms of its technology and in terms of its aims had transformed the character of war. Now, 
for Kuntz, he clearly believed that one could separate the means and the ends here. So you could separate the technology, the, the mode by which warfare was to be undertaken, and the ends that one used for it. Um, everything depends, he was to suggest, upon the heart of men who use them. He was nevertheless to indicate, or he was nevertheless conscious of the way in which science and technology itself seemed to lead the way. It required a support infrastructure of science, research, industry, manufacturing. It required the keeping of secrets. It required a, an infrastructure of surveillance. And to the extent that it made all parts of economy and society integrated in some form or other into the organization of this new technology dependent mode of warfare, it required on all sides parties to wage their warfare in ideological terms. One needed to indoctrinate each belligerent nation with deadly hatred, he says, of the enemy, to make the enemy infamous down to the roots of its national, historical, and cultural character and history. Total war mm -hmm. must be fought in ideological terms. Mm -hmm. Now this is in some ways the image or the idea that, that, that Kennedy brings out, or he refers to, although he's referring to it in a very thin sense, Total war is a war of unlimited ends um, with unlimited means, but he's not talking about the sustaining infrastructure, the governmental rationality that operates behind it. Now, what Kuntz had been hinting at, I think, um, had already been made clear in some form or another by Eisenhower in his farewell speech, um, where he warned that the US society was in danger of being overtaken by as I'm sure you're aware, the military-industrial complex mm -hmm. governed by a scientific technological elite. Mm -hmm. um, but it was an idea that was also picked up elsewhere and thematized and more system systematically in the work of Herbert Marcuse, uh, his book, One Dimensional Man, which I, I think he outlined in some ways the rationality of a certain form of Cold War governmentality. The threat of atomic catastrophe was not merely was merely the external expression of a mode of government organised around, as he put it, the peaceful production of the means of destruction, mm -hmm. and administered technologically driven one-dimensional society. I'll just quote a little bit from Marcuse here. Uh, the main trends are familiar, he remarked concentration of the national economy on the needs of big corporations, with the government as a stimulating, supporting, and sometimes even controlling force. Hitching of this economy to a worldwide system of military alliances, monetary arrangements, technical assistance, and development schemes. Gradual assimilation of blue-collar and white-collar population, of leadership types in business and labor. Fostering of a pre-established harmony between scholarship and the national purpose. Mm -hmm. Invasion of the private household by the togetherness of public opinion, opening of the bedroom to the me media of mass communication. What he was trying to get at in all of these formations was the way in which a technologically de dependent mm -hmm. mode of warfare, or indeed in this sense, a mode of defense, mm -hmm. required the co option of all institutions of society from the army, obviously, at one end, through big business, through educational institutions, through cultural institutions such as Hollywood, down into advertising agencies and so on. Um, and that was, an, uh, uh, in a sense, a framework or a, 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 a system of administering a, 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 a populace it, with the end of the defense of the national interest and, the, and with the... Um, with nuclear weaponry as, in some ways, the coalescing idea. Part of Marcuse's critique, and this is where I'm going to get back to Beveridge rather than belatedly, was that the way in which a technologically, the way in which a technological veil had descended on advanced industrial society, transforming domination into administration. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, the welfare state re represented to him a way of both producing and responding to the administered desires and needs of the population as part of a system that had as its end the production of socially necessary waste. Mm. 
So the welfare state was part of a warfare state, which was a form of totally total administration. This was not a mechanism or system that promoted self-determination or freedom, he added. Rather, it was a state of unfreedom. Now, I was going to end with a couple of reflections about whether or not that formation is still in play, and maybe we can come back to that. Um, but I think one of the th whether or not one follows Marquis's analysis of the welfare state, I think one of the points to bring out here is that this form of analysis, which is taken up <coughs> by, by uh, people like Edgerton, who writes about the British welfare state at the same time, one of the connections here is about the links between warfare and welfare, and about the way in which they are mutually mm -hmm. sustaining forms of governance. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, let's engage in a conversation about this then. <laughs> yeah. um, so the, the, I want to st I'll start, like most people do, with the last comment you made on, on the welfare, warfare yeah. state. A um, couple of things struck me about that. One is the, the architects of the welfare state, in particular Bevan, um, were quite anti-Soviet in some ways. So, so they, the, the sense one gets from the British establishment in the mid-40s is that while the Labour government was welfareist and was seeking to change the terms of government in the United Kingdom, the extent to which it did that's questionable because it left private education in place and so on. But nevertheless, there was a sense that there was some sort of revolution going on. Didn't translate to much of a fear that foreign policy would change. So the Labour government seemed to be as anti-Soviet, for example, as the Conservative government went before it. So welfareism and warfareism, in a way, sat quite comfortably with each other. Um, but the other thought I had was that, the, that the, in a way, the Soviet Union won the Cold War. Then, uh, according to this, this <laughs> I mean, if we think of the, if we think of a particular version of the Soviet state. Um, Let's say the, the sort of Brezhnevian era state. Well, I'm, I'm, so my nostalgia is for, for how can you say to somebody from, from Russia that yeah. you're, you're nostalgic for Brezhnev? <laughs> I don't mean I'm nostalgic for Brezhnev, I'm nostalgic for, for, the, for the Brezhnev period, what it, what it sort of signified. And, mm -hmm. um, for example, I went back to photographs of Brezhnev and discovered he was much younger than I thought he was at the time. Um, where I'd always thought of him as representing the sort of dead end of Soviet utopia. Um, but maybe that welfare warfare state that, 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 that at least the, that the Brezhnev era mm -hmm. is symptomatic of is, is a version of the state that we now mm -hmm. exist in. I mean, you talked about Marcuse and surveillance and so on. We, we feel now mm -hmm. as if we live in a, in a system which is, mm -hmm. in, in which we experience very intense forms of surveillance. Mm -hmm. A continuing potency of the state, despite everything we hear. We, 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 for example, we're constantly told that that um, uh, Reagan and Thatcher had sort of unraveled the state, but then there's a whole revisionist scholarship around that, which suggests that in fact the state grew more powerful under Thatcher um, and Reagan. So, in other words, we sort of live in a welfare warfare state that was a, a creation of both the, the beverage moment and the Cold War. To, to sort of bring these themes in, 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 your, in your talk together. Mm -hmm. um, and just on, on, on to a question for Tatiana would be about, uh, about co coexistence. So you, I, I experienced a certain amount of, or I got, I, I, what came off you was a certain nostalgia for the moment of coexistence. Mm -hmm. so, so the conventional picture of the Cold War that international lawyers used to, used to pre present to themselves mm -hmm. was that this was a bad moment for international law. <laughs> Because here were two states that just couldn't agree, they were ideological enemies, where could international law get any purchase in such a system? And, and, and the 1990s then were seen as this sort of rebirth, rehabilitation, revival, a renaissance of the whole international legal system. Finally, international law could get going. Um, the whole thing had stalled in the 1940s. We were supposed to build a, a system of international economic law, international criminal law, international human rights system. Uh, at least the first two just stalled. We hanged a few Nazis and then it all stopped. <laughs> um, and nothing happened until the end of the Cold War when we could get on with prosecuting people and sending them to jail again. And this seemed like a good thing for, for international lawyers. 
Um, but your story is very different. You were sort of looking back uh, on, on the Cold War and saying, that actually, it was the ideological conflict that yeah. produced the causes for the need for um, some form of coexistence or cooperation, a, a more sort of pluralistic international mm -hmm. law of, of cooperation. And that struck me as very interesting and slightly counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I was, yeah, I mean, I to respond to the, the point about similarities between the Soviet Union and, and, uh, and the United States, I suppose my, the more I've been looking and reading about particularly the formation that was characterized by US society through the 50s, the more I come to the view that actually the differences in terms of the formation are very, very small. Um, they are both hugely centralized. There's huge centralized control in the United States of the research capability. So something like 60% of US research is channeled through various branches of the military. That <coughs> largesse is organizing the, the way in which the economy is, is, is running. So the, the amount of money it's pushing through various different uh, manufacturing industries is to present it very, very similar in, in, in many, many ways. So, so in some ways, the, the ideological polar points of you know, market economy on, and centralized states and the other just doesn't really provide a terribly good picture about how these, how these societies function. And Britain was just the same. I mean, the you know, nationalizing industries, left, right, and center in 1946 to 48, the Herbert Morrison nationalization agenda, just doesn't make it look as if it's on a ideological polar point to, to the Soviet Union. Um, so I think one of the interesting things is about how similar they are. Uh, and, and if one is to think about the Cold War as being a thing, um, and we haven't really talked about that. I mean, one of the, one of the questions I suppose we had a, animating our project from the, the outset was the problem about trying to think about the Cold War as a, either a period of history or as a thing, insofar as it was, a, it was a language used to describe a set of relationships, and it was used only in certain parts of the world. Um, so we were trying to be aware, quite I mean, self-critical about how, how we were talking about, how we were thinking about the Cold War. But the one thing that you could say is that the Cold War was a particular way of thinking about government, uh, governing and relating to other um, other government, you know, hell bent on a, 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 uh, a form of ideological mm -hmm. conflict. So, one thing it did seem to embrace the commonalities between mm -hmm. the Soviet Union and mm -hmm. the US and indeed Britain to some extent. Mm -hmm. And the commonalities were the way in which they mm -hmm. organized themselves internally, the way in which mm -hmm. government related to the arms industry, to, you know, Science and technology, and to, to the funding of space operations, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, Can I jump? In yeah, sure? jump in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that actually that is very important that you brought in in the in the end of your speech this technological dimension of Cold War, and the fact that we live in this technology-driven society these days. Everyone has a gadget, as far as I see, right? Is exactly the cold uh, the legacy of Cold War as well. Is and if what you said right now is that, and this is something that I also try to say, uh, talking about Cold War as a modernist project that puts science very high and authority and kind of enlightened authority very high again. I think that's very important dimension of Cold War, and uh, having science serving national interests that's again a cold war mentality that we still live in. So in this respect, I think we have so much of legacy of cold war being the basis of the system of education, of the system of uh, funding science these days, uh, both in the south and in the north, west and east. It's all going on, so to say. And I was just wondering, Gary, why are you so nostalgic about creation <laughs> of time? I'm not. I was actually born in 78, and I'm not at all. Thanks. Yes. Uh. <laughs> why, why do you have it? She was born earlier. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. But it's, that's because I think one of the reasons could be that 
uh, you know, it, it was kind of funny that time that the Soviets were not really such a threat anymore. No, precisely. And uh, they, it, it was kind of all over. It was already gone. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole struggle, so to say. Yeah, the consumeristic society, the the better the Hollywood actually won, so to say. Hmm. Well, I can't imagine that it was much fun living in the Soviet Union in no. that period. I'm not suggesting that. Uh, I mean, it's slightly paradoxical. You, you're right. There, 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 look, I'm not the only one. There is a nostalgia for yeah. for, for the Cold War around. I come is, from the place which is nostalgic, right? Right. And there's, for example, Owen Hatherley and and. and well, it feels to me like a, a, a nostalgia for, 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 for Soviet architecture, or even Soviet literature, Soviet brutalism, mm. people visiting Ceausescu's mm. parliament mm. in Bucharest, uh, going to Al Albania, anti-tank mm. emplacements, visiting the DMZ between v North and South Vietnam. Mm. There's a, I mean, there's a kind of kitsch. Yeah. built up around the Cold yeah. War, which I think I, I might be responding to. But it's pa slightly paradoxical in that the 1980s, when I grew up, uh, was also a period in which it was very dangerous. Uh, the Cold War took a funny little, it, 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 it was a kink in the story. Um, you're right, you could argue that after Cuba, things got mm -hmm. safer or appeared to get mm -hmm. safer. Appearances might be everything when it comes to the Cold War. Mm -hmm. But it felt as if um, by the time of the Brezhnev era and detente um, in particular, the, a nuclear war seemed very, very unlikely. Mm -hmm. But then there was that strange moment in the, in the, in the 1980s with the um, introduction of medium-range missiles into, mm -hmm. into Europe and the positioning of SS-20s mm -hmm. um, in, in the Soviet Union, when, when actually it looked as if a, a, a nuclear war might begin by accident, and then with Reagan and so on, it was that very unstable moment before the Cold War ended. So I'm not sure if I'm, I'm I'd say I was, I was nostalgic for that, but in our project, we have, um, again, I'm not sure if nostalgia is the right word for this. Um, we were on, there was a panel recently, which one of the German, we were, we were talking in our class, that's what it was, in re, on rethinking international law. The, the Germans have a word called nostalgia. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. uh, Nostalgia for the mm. East, yeah. and I, I said that young people today, um, in their sort of late teens, early twenties, uh, have that uh, idea about East Berlin. Mm. It's, it's a very yeah. sort of fashionable place, a lot more fashionable than Paris or, or mm. New York. And I think mm. that's a, a response to mm -hmm. um, a response to all of that. But our part of our nostalgia for the some aspects of the Cold War. Um, are about the sense that during the Cold War, again somewhat paradoxically, this standoff between these two modernist arcs or ideologies mm -hmm. um, allowed for or gave expression to, um, a, a, I hesitate to use the, the term third way here, but, mm. a, but, 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 but a third form of, mm. of politics or a third form of diplomacy um, in, in the non-aligned movement, Not the one, yeah. and the idea of neutrality, mm -hmm. an idea that, as I've said, has become so unfashionable in international mm -hmm. law. No one talks about neutrality yeah. anymore. No one, it seems, yeah. can be neutral. And we're always told not to be neutral, not to be non-aligned. Precisely, how can you be? We were told by mm -hmm. George uh, W. Bush, how can you be neutral as between us? Mm -hmm. And the terrorists, and since all our wars yeah. have become anti-terrorist wars, as Carl Schmidt predicted, it's 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 impossible to find a foothold for neutrality. And and, and and indeed, who would you be neutral in relation to anymore? I mean, if there is one single hegemonic legal mm -hmm. political project, it's hard to know where, where where you would position yourself as neutral. I'm neutral vis-a-vis -vis the UN, as, as we, again, as we were discussing in class recently, Switzerland was neutral vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the UN. But that was a strange position to take, because we all thought the UN was neutral. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> it's hard to know where neutrality would, would, would get any purchase. But, but in the Cold War, there was, there was a lot of room for the mm -hmm. idea of, of neutrality. And it was a very, it was a very vigorous and vibrant mm -hmm. and diplomatically quirky uh, neutrality mm -hmm. 
the Not Alive movement and the Bandung Conference uh, uh, meetings in 1955, and the idea, as we've said before, that, that people like Sukarno and Tito and Nehru could come together and create this different diplomatic atmosphere, as, 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 as our colleague um, Sandeep Bahuja has pointed out. These meetings, for example, look, just looked very different. The, the leadership of the non aligned movement used to deliberately walk slowly down the street in order that people could come up to them and mm -hmm. say hello and greet them. I mean, we are miles away from that now, the diplomatic summits that we have, which are you know, heavily securitized. You can't get near mm -hmm. our leaders anymore when mm -hmm. they engage in these summits. So there's a whole style and an atmosphere around that idea of non alignment in the Cold War, which it's hard not to be nostalgic for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm weary of my own nostalgia mm -hmm. around the Cold War, particularly the bits I didn't live through. You know, it's, it's hard to be nostalgic for the, for the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example. <laughs> and, um, the, 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 though we're nostalgic for John F. Kennedy and, and, and some of the choices he made during the, mm -hmm. the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the Cuban Missile Crisis for international lawyers, again, it's, it's slightly paradoxical. It's seen as a uh, you know, both a very dangerous moment, but a golden moment for for, for, for diplomacy. You know, yeah. Robert Kennedy's brilliant idea of, of, of answering Khrushchev's first letter rather than the second mm -hmm. one. You know, the film yeah. representations and all that. But it was clearly, a, you know, a really dangerous moment. So as Christopher Hitchens said, where were you standing when John F. Kennedy nearly killed you? Uh, and so Kennedy's diplomacy was very dangerous. It was a very dangerous form of brinkmanship. But but you know, to, to go to, to the non-aligned movement. I mean, are we making too much of our Nostalgia for the non-aligned movement. I, I position the non-aligned movement as a, as a sort of beverage moment, you know, a glorious third way, possibly redistributive moment. Well, it was diplomacy that was being redistributed rather than goods. Mm -hmm. um, but have we made too much of that that mm -hmm. that, that non-aligned moment in mm -hmm. our in our work? Mm -hmm. Or is that a sort of self-answering question? I don't it's know. It's like a self-answering question. I mean, I was just reflecting on on. You talking about warfare, and it just struck me that one of the if we're thinking about going back to Kennedy's speech when he's talking about the threat of total warfare, and I was thinking, well, isn't the contemporary problem is that warfare is now total mm -hmm. in a way yeah. that it was never total yeah. in those days. Yeah. Total in the sense that there is no part of the globe, there is no sphere in which warfare cannot and does not take place. Yeah. It's dislocated from, you know, no longer it takes place in the battlefield, no longer it takes place in spaces overseas in Vietnam, or it takes place everywhere all the mm -hmm. time. So yeah. the idea that warfare has become, in some ways, the signal mode by which our world is organized. Can I jump in here yeah. with, I really love Kim Shepard's research on that. Uh, she explores exactly how the United States used use the 19, uh, the, uh, the 9 11 moment, so to say, in uploading the international law, anti terror general norms that were downloaded then to national states and actually empowered many national states to prosecute political crime within their national borders. And that was heavily used by Turkey, that was used in Hungary, that was used in all the problematic places that we have these days. And that's exactly something that actually uh, Kennedy says in his speech. He uses this wonderful uh, wording, peace of the grave and security of the slave. And this is somehow <laughs> something that is creeping more and more in the reality that we live in, that when security, rather than peace, rather than neutrality, rather than you know, better choices, is getting more and more powerful as something nobody can object to, security. So uh, just to go back to yeah to go back to neutrality and, and beverage. I mean, there's a, there's a, of course, there's a classic liberal idea that the state. The state should be neutral. It should somehow be a neutral arbiter uh, mm. above individual or sectoral interests. Mm. And this is the sort of this is an idealized version of the of the, of the liberal state. In a way, the beverage state looks a bit different because it makes hard, substantive choices. It's a more political, mm -hmm. not always entirely liberal state. There are mm. illiberal aspects to 
to beverage. So that, that, that got me thinking about whether international law, and to ask a famous question, you know, what's international law actually for? Mm. Um, I mean, should it be for something? So that in the Cold War, we, in a way, we had three international laws. We had, a, we had, the, we had socialist international law, which mm -hmm. was clearly for socialism. Mm -hmm. um, we had an American version of international law, maybe represented by the New Haven School, maybe not, which was sort of for either American foreign policy overtly and boldly, um, or at least for some form of American constitutionalism that could be could migrate to the international mm -hmm. sphere. And then we had a third international law which wasn't for anything. It was precisely something that just stood above the mm -hmm. two, as you put it, formations, the, the, the Soviets and, and the US. And the whole idea was that international law wasn't for anything. The idea for international law, to circle back to your first point, was that it was, it was a law of, of coexistence mm. and cooperation. So the idea of international law then is a sort of thin diplomatic mm. scheme to make sure that poten potential enemies, adversaries, friends, whoever they, whoever they are, at least get on reasonably well in this thin Rawlsian yeah. scheme. You could put that uh, another way and say that formation was actually not being not for anything, but international law being for itself. Mm. So the end of international law was international law. Um, it was, in a sense, the validation of the, the value of the, the, the means, the instrument. Mm. And I think there's, there's an interesting mm. idea that floats around, that still floats around in some ways, but certainly floating around in the 1950s and 60s, it was about the, the relationship between means and ends. And part of Marcuse's critique was that ends had disappeared, that the, the means were, be be in a sense, the ends in their own right. That the way in which you were organized things, the forms of technology you had, the forms of knowledge that you produced through the technology themselves, mm -hmm. in a sense, re-described themselves in terms of what was desirable, what should be done. Um, so you become, a, in a sense, a world that's organized through the forms of knowledge that technology provided available to, to you. Um, and I think that's part of part of what the, for, the really interesting formation that emerges in this time is about the way in which particular forms of worldly knowledge come into play um, through the Cold War, and particularly through the Cold War technology of space, satellite imagery, mm -hmm. and, and and surveillance, um, and that leads on to a whole different stories to be told there, but in, international environmental law comes out of, in some ways, the, the knowledge that's developed by weather monitoring satellites that are pr principally, in the first instance, say, military satellites. Um, so there's a sort of conjunction there between both Pacific ends of the Cold War and the military ends and the production of certain forms of knowledge in its wake. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, in terms of the forms of knowledge that we have. Yes, we live in a post-Cold War world very, very concretely. These are things that we've got to navigate around the world, GPS, clone mm -hmm. house, and whatever else, are, are, are forms of technology that were, in the first instance, military technology. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you, and then, yeah. and then we'll, 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 we'll throw it open. Um, and the question is, uh, I mean, to go back to this neutrality point yet again. Um, so maybe the most dis maybe the disappointing thing about post Cold War international law is that it now is for something. It's for all sorts of projects we might or might not find disappointing, like human rights um, or neoliberalism or free markets or whatever. But it, it is now for something, and that that may be problematic. But let, let, if you just accept my hypothesis that, that there was an international law that wasn't for anything in particular during the Cold War, mm -hmm. a kind of thin, as I say, thin diplomatic cooperative law of coexistence, and, and, and if you permit me to be nostalgic about that international law, then one question would be, uh, why did the Soviets sign up to that? Because th th that was, that struck, strikes me in retrospect as a, as a slightly odd thing to do. So the, the Soviets, on one hand, they were committed to the idea of socialist international law as a, 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 
an exceptional space that could be carved out of any other international law, which wasn't nearly as important, some sort of capitalist idea of international law. The important thing was socialist international law. And socialist international law, for example, mm -hmm. permitted the invasion of Hungary in 1956 mm -hmm. and Czechoslovakia in 68 in a way that traditional international law would not have permitted. Um, but the Soviets do talk, shift from this idea of socialist international law mm -hmm. after the sort of Vyshinsky, Pashukhanist era into the sort of Tunkin era, where they now say, oh, maybe we can sign up to this international law of coexistence. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll put our socialism to the side of it. As, 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 as you could say, Stalin did a bit mm -hmm. uh, in order to fight the Second World War with his sworn enemies, the capitalist state. Mm -hmm. So, I, mean, I don't know if you've got any sense of how that how or why that happened? That was a long-term tradition. The Russians took very important role in developing uh, international law in the end of the 19th century. And people like Fyodor Martins are celebrated by the founders of international law, at least in Russia. And the ambition here was exactly this modernist ambition of civilized nations. So that was the ambition of Russia being an important role in the world, providing the norms of coexistence. Mm -hmm. And the and our colleague Peter Holquist does wonderful work on that, on Russian input, historical work, Russian input in development of international law. A part of that was this understanding of technolo technological backwardness, especially after the Crimean War that was lost by Russia uh, in the 60s. And that gave an alert in terms of arranging the world order through other means, <laughs> arranging the spheres of influence that could be protected, if not by force and technology, then by uh, norms of international order that s some civilized nations, empires, you recognize and treat respectfully. So that was a long-term ambition. And after the revolution, Russia was out, Soviet Union was out of the process, being too margina marginal, but still, actually doing very well with the United, uh, uh, with the Great Britain, since trade was over the ideological, <coughs> ideological clashes. And the World War II and alliance with the great powers and victory in World War II gave the Soviet Union legacy to and that was actually in Yalta, in Crimea, in 1945, then ambitions, imperial ambitions of Russia were voiced again, that the hegemonic, uh, the hegemonic ambitions of uh, the Soviet Union following the Russian imperial he hegemonic ambitions in the region should be treated respectfully. And that was the thinking, that that was the imperial thinking that was shared mm. by other imperial powers who agreed on uh, Soviet Union's leading role in certain parts of the globe that was treated respectfully in terms of imperial legal imagination, that there are spheres of influence, spheres of kind of clean hands, dealing with national states. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I actually had one final question for you, though, and it, it goes back to Stephen. Stephen was there at the uh, Sam, Samuel Moyne lecture last, last week or two weeks ago. And uh, it's a question about, so, so one possibility when we think about beverage and international law is that if beverage uh, live today, he'd have left the LSE to work for Amnesty International instead, <laughs> or, or Human Rights Watch, or he'd have gone to the UN, disappeared into the bureaucracy there, <laughs> that, that people like Beveridge um, tend not to work 
mm. in domestic settings anymore. Well, another way to put this, and this is the, the, the Moynish point, um, though he, he seemed to adjust that thesis a bit in his talk two weeks ago, mm. is that in a way international human rights mm. in general, maybe international human rights law, has displaced um, the sort of redistributive visions that beverage represents in the imagination of young and not so young people today. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the relationship between international law and beverage is a slightly complicated, perhaps even malign one, in which, um, in which yeah, as I say, redistributive visions disappear to be replaced by you know, a quite technocratic, mm -hmm. sometimes disappointing, uh, sometimes thin form of legalism around highly individualized human rights. So it's it's the displacement of a of a grand collective project um, from cradle to grave. The beverage idea that we'd all be cared for by the state to a system in which we assert these human rights in courts, but we assert them as lonely, sort of existential individuals mm -hmm. and. Even the way I'm phrasing it indicates how disappointing I think that move might have been. Um, so, what so what do we think of that? Human rights. Yeah. I mean, is that does that seem remotely plausible, or should we just throw things open? Yeah. Well, Hannah Arendt's critique of human rights as the rights of those who don't possess any any rights. Mm. is still very influential, is still very <laughs> something that we should keep in mind. <coughs> well, in, in Russian legal tradition, human <coughs> rights rhetoric is um, treated very with great hostility because uh, in general, natural law rhetoric, natural law doctrine is very much against the concept of sovereignty as something that belongs to the leader uh, and not to the people, and something that does that doesn't really ba is not really based on natural right, uh, rights basis at all. Mm. So the the rights and freedoms can be delivered, should be delivered by the sovereign. So that's just very different thinking about rights. Mm. There's a sort of curious schizophrenia when you look at countries yeah, like Britain. And you follow track the, the, the approach they took internationally in relation to yeah, the drafting of the covenants or debates with the European Convention and so on. There's a curious schizophrenia there between the kinds of values that they are mm. extolling externally and the kinds mm. of things they're putting in place domestically. Um, so one version of that was yeah, the human rights rule was rights for other people. Mm -hmm. you know, these were, they were always yeah. rights beyond borders mm -hmm. in the sense that they, you know, it's, it was always people in the colonies who needed human rights, not the people <laughs> at home, um, or people in, in the Soviet Union who needed <laughs> rights, not people, people in, in Britain. So there was that dimension to it, but it's schizophrenic in the sense that they were articulating a particular ideology, and this is coming out over and over again in the UN Commission, which was at odds with the formation, you know, the national formation that had been put, put in place by the ethnic government, Morrison's nationalization agenda. Um, so on the one hand, you could say that you know, this is it, it, it's a curious, and they, it was a sort of a double speak there. There's an internal, external idea that was running through the British government, through the least gendered in the foreign office. Um, and you could probably say the same about their approach to, to foreign investment and protection of, you know, um, property overseas, so you know, only a few years in the aftermath of, uh, of the nationalisation, they are objecting to the, the Iranian nationalisation of uh, um, Anglo-Iranian um, on the grounds that yeah, there was an absolute right to the preservation of the sanctity of British property. Uh, in circumstances where the British government was getting more from tax taxation revenues from Anglo-Iranian and the Iranian government was getting in payment for the oil. So there was a, you know, there were, I, I just wonder about, you know, how, how were they occupying two incompatible, what seemed to be two incompatible positions? 
way you can imagine it is to think that you know, there is something different about when you step outside Britain. The rest of the world is somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got a little bit of time for questions and answers. A show of hands. Yes. I just wonder, thank you. I actually just want to hear you. Um, I just wonder if you're a nostalgic area, I mean certainly nostalgia I share. The same age, but the impression I got sitting here from from the panel is there was a lot of um, how about it, how did I put it? But you know, the Cold War was a was a good period, and, the, and I was just wondering actually if the the, the current you know, U.S. administration and Russian administration actually share that nostalgia that we were talking about, mm -hmm. in that at that time they were great powers, they are now not so great powers, and I just wonder see the necessity of a new Cold War as being something that could act as the catalyst for them mm -hmm. perhaps be finding their greatness. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a question there, but... Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, yeah. well yeah. in Russia the nostalgia is, nostalgia is very strong for sure. And that's, I think you're very right about this great powerness thing on, on, on the Russian side for sure. It's, it's very much present, and the, you can observe it with the, with, the, the, with the American presence in Russian media. It's just so interesting, it's even a bit humiliating to see how much of space is given to the states in Russian media, in both printed on, and on TV. It's so much about America that it's sometimes it's it seems that it's even less that Russia, even in inner news, domestic news, play less role than uh, American ones. And that's exactly this is that serves the purpose to construct again this idea of struggle with powerful enemy. And that struggle can explain everything. That struggle can explain poetry. That struggle can explain. Uh, you know all the negative, uh, all the all the negativity of uh, of current life in Russia, so to say, and deficit of welfare state. That's for sure. Yeah. Mm. Other questions? Oh, just to go back to this question, then. What, what's the what's the relative standing of? Um, President Obama and President Trump in, in Russian political life. Uh, I mean, I, I, just, I, I asked this because I saw a documentary called The Final Year, about mm -hmm. Obama's final year, and, and I didn't, I felt that Obama's foreign policy, and I've always felt this in relation to the, to the Russians, was misguided, really, and it came through very strongly. It was very sanctimonious, very moralistic, mm. pretty misguided, and mm. represented by Samantha Power's mm. regular uh, syrupy outbursts at the Security Council against the, against the Russians. And all that seemed to me terribly mistaken for mm. the very reason you give given us. There's, like, there's a humiliation mm. there. Um, but Trump has a very different view of, 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 of Russia. I mean, mm. he has, he's had, it seems, business dealings with the Russians. I don't really see why that's so deeply problematic. Mm. He was a business mm. man after all. Mm. But um, mm. so when it comes to Obama and Trump and the Russians, I don't really have a dog in that fight. I wondered if the, uh, if the Russians feel the same as me. Well, there were many hopes about Trump. There was uh, there was a discussion that we Russian has always dealt better with Republicans than with Demo mm. Democrats. Mm. So there were there was so much. He was even called our candidate. So Trump was Russian <laughs> candidate at the elections. So that he was actually United Russia can you, candidate. We have this party, the only party called United Russia. So he was United Russia candidate. But I think that that's very interesting comment that you had. That that our like the impression of our panel is that the Cold War is a good thing. I think we should somehow react on that. Cold War is a good thing. 
Yeah, and that's a funny thing because I think it's a continuation of what we actually also, what I was, for example, trying to to bring to the floor is this moral dimension of Cold War. That was very heavy. That was very heavy. That that was a competition of kind of morals and the and the kind of flag words like liberty, freedom uh, in the West or justice and social justice in the East. That was very heavily used and even exploited during Cold War. And this is what, what we still have in media, this kind of very moralistic discourse on Cold War that kind of pushes us to take this good, bad kind of evaluations and extremes. But I would like you also, having, having in mind your project, yeah, that's a good thing. Cold War is a, is a good thing since you have a wonderful project on that. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we got research funding for it as well. Yeah, so see? It's a very good project. Mark um, right. So I think, I think our position would be that there, are th there is a sense of loss with the end of the Cold War, that certain things were possible then that are no longer possible. Um, but I think we also have in mind that certain things continue. So it's not as if the Cold War is entirely over. That there are formations that, that run on, and those aren't necessarily all good by any means. Um, so we're going to be advocating running back the top clock. But I think we do have in mind the idea that there are certain forms of opposition resistance mm -hmm. to power, certain he hegemonic formations mm -hmm. that have gone, that we've lost, mm -hmm. um, the forms of being together or thinking about forms of community that we just don't have available to us, um, or don't seem to be available. And I think we have mm -hmm. you know, part of it maybe to think about how you resurrect things in a context where you don't have a, let's say, a bipolar antagonism which mm -hmm. actually enables certain things to be said, mm -hmm. um, certain things to be put on the table, simply because there is someone out there who you know will be, you know, my enemy's enemy is my friend, mm -hmm. certain things <laughs> become available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not so much that we think the Cold War is a good thing, it's just that we think it might not be a bad thing. <laughs> uh, but maybe there may be things that we want to retrieve up for. Uh, one, one, one of, one of the, also one of the arguments we want to make in this project is that it may not be a thing. Um, uh, it's sort of positioned in all sorts of different ways as a, as a moment in time, a uh, period in time that can be compressed and stretched. Is it 1917 to the present day, or did it start with the French Revolution, or is it really between the Korean War and the, and the Cuban Missile Crisis? So even, even in its temporal dimensions, it's quite elastic. Um, but of course, the question about w what sort of thing it is is very important to us. You know, how it was created, where, it, where its origins lie, what sort of project it was, whose interests it served to call this thing, if it is a thing, um, the Cold War. But what we were very animated by um, was the sense that the Cold War was being used um, as the explanation for so yeah. much uh, in yeah. international law, the absence of so much. I mean, I used to say that the, the, uh, the, 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 the second answer to every question in, in international law was the Nicaragua case. And the first answer then was, oh, it's the end of the Cold War. I heard so many people say, you know, how did this happen? They'd say, oh, well, it happened because of the end of the Cold War. And the other question was, why did this not happen? And the answer was, well, that's because of the Cold War. And I thought the Cold War is doing an amazing amount of work in our field um, mm -hmm. as a way of answering questions. Uh, from the start. So what, what, what is this work that it's doing and does the work that it's doing reflect anything about what the Cold War was or what it could imagine could be imagined to be in retrospect? But I think we have one final question from the uh, floor. There's kind of there's a tentative hand went up. <laughs> right. Yeah, fine. We'll take a question over here. I, I'm not sure if we actually need the microphone, but... Uh, so it's just over to the left here. Oh, we have two Thank questions. You. I'll do it. Okay. Well, thank you, Jonas Koskera, from Finland. And I was very disappointed you didn't mention the Helsinki Convention, the OSCE process as an actor to 
end the Cold War, and even it was, it was not meant by the Soviet Union, because they wanted to maintain the status quo that to the citizens movements and other places was actually a very important point. So uh, my question is, uh, why isn't uh, the global society wanting to have a more efficient policy structure? Because all those frozen problems around the different corners of the Soviet Union, they are just frozen and this multilateral organization doesn't don't do not maybe anything but enough to, to end them. So why is it then that kind of a uh, silent moment on those those measures of avoiding a new lengthened football? Okay, we'll take a question in the, in the center and we'll, we'll wind up. Thanks. Um, I was trying to think what the what the beverage moment in international relations would, would be, and I, I, the, the obvious thing I suppose is decolonization and, and, and independence. And the, the Cold War is a uh, something we could be nostalgic about, I suppose, is is was cold for us, but it was hot for South America and Africa and Southeast Asia and, and so on. To, to what extent do you think that relates to you know, the what international law says, or is that essentially a, a, a rejection of completely ignoring international law and, and simply the exercise of, of, of power by the two sides? Thank you. I think this is very valuable input in the discussion because the uh, one of the reasons exactly to be nostalgic about this rivalry of great powers is that the, the, the Soviet Union, for instance, was very interested in bringing in more supporters, the global scheme, so to say. And our colleague, Philippa Harrington, does this wonderful research on uh, international law against trafficking and prostitution. And uh, her, res her research shows that Soviet Union played a very important role in <coughs> struggle against colonial clause of 1954 con convention and other uh, conventions. And that was the clause that actually allowed former empires to decide on the part, on behalf of their colonies or pro protectorate states. And that was a very important part of Soviet Union rhetoric uh, of anti-colonialism, and not only rhetoric, but political steps uh, empowering the former colonies to be international independent players on the world scheme, so to say. So that, that idea that actually you, Matt, brought in that this, if not now it's 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 very it, it used to be a popular concept in Russian discourse, multipolarity of the world. Mm -hmm. That there are different interests, and these interests <coughs> should be mutually respected in international politics. But still, the idea that <coughs> kind of multi agencies of states that should be uh, should be respected and treated. Seriously, that was a very important part of Cold War international law, so to say. And this is something less visible these days. I was thinking of going, I mean, I think my answer to that would be, I mean, I would, I share with you, would be to go back to the thing that you gestured towards right at the beginning, Gary, which is about the new international economic order. Because one of the, one of the, um, ideas animating the neo-imperialist agenda. So mm -hmm. it's the agenda sort of set out by Krumer of the independence, saying mm -hmm. that now we've gained political independence, we have to gain economic independence. And they were two separate, they understood them as two separate processes. And Fanon talked about independence being a fragment of independence. Mm -hmm. um, 
and they were clear that so, so to try and think about decolonization as a, a beverage moment I think is fundamentally problematic because if it's a beverage moment it's a moment that was never grasped and that there was a long going ongoing campaign through that traveled through the new international economic order and the Charter on Economic Rights and Duties of the States to precisely in a sense gain their beverage moment mm. um, and they, I think it was infinitely deferred. It never happened. Um, so you could say that decolonization was definitively not the beverage moment for <coughs> the newly independent states, N certainly not the moment that they were hoping for, that they were wanting. Um, they never, never got that moment. Hmm. Um, well, I think we should finish because it's exactly 8 p.m. So um, first of all, thank you all for coming out on this rainy night to uh, the Beverage Festival. Um, and can you join me in thanking our speakers, Tatiana and Matt, for a fascinating <laughs>